Hello everyone, uh, thank you so much uh, Pinterest for uh, having us here and thank you for hosting this meetup and thank you so much for sharing your experience with Druid with the community. It's, uh, uh, I think uh, in open source contribution one of a really big contribution that you can make always is to just share your experience so that other people know uh, kind of like what's the path to production like and how like you encounter challenges and you keep going. Um, and uh, actually your talk is a great uh, uh, lead up to my talk because uh, I wanted to talk about something a little bit different. I wanted to talk about uh, the work that's, being, that's going on right now in Druid inside of the project to improve the Druid UX. Uh, but first of all, uh, a little bit about me. My name is Vadim. Uh, I'm co-founder at Imply, uh, the company that's really based around Druid. Uh, I'm a Druid committer. Uh, I'm more importantly the first Druid user in the universe. So uh, back in the day, uh, Druid was a brand new project, wasn't open source yet. Somebody sent me, and that somebody was Eric Cheddar, sent me a, a message on HipChat. Uh, there was a thing uh, being, hey, run this query, and then I ran it, and I got some data back, and I was like, cool. That mm -hmm. doesn't seem like a memorable day right now, but maybe I'll recall it sometime later. Um, and I'm passionate about UX and making things easy to use. And, uh, you know, the thing about Druid is from day one uh, of when the project was open sourced, Druid was fast, it was scalable, it could really do what, uh, what it kind of says on the tin. Uh, it was running in production before it was even open source, there was an internal project at Metamarkets, which is a company that uh, I worked at previously, uh, and then it was just kind of opened up, Netflix was our first partner and they ran it on a huge, huge scale. Uh, but Druid was never described as being very easy to use or being very user friendly. Uh, and I think if you were like paying attention to the previous talk, you were like, man, this seems like a bit, com a bit of a complicated system. Uh, so I want to talk about how to go about thinking through changing that, what we're doing to, what's currently happening in the project to sort of change Druid from being a complicated system to, whoa, this is, this is so, so simple. Uh, and uh, where, where this is all headed. And spoiler alert, uh, a lot of this talk is going to focus on uh, this, uh, it's going to kind of revolve around this web console that we have now built and shipped as part of Druid. Uh, it lets you do a lot of really cool stuff and, it, and I think it's pretty nice. Uh, and I will kind of cover different areas of it, uh, but this is kind of what this talk is about. Uh, it's about how Druid became the database with what I hope is the coolest web console out there. Um, so when you think about a database and you think about what makes what do you need to do to make the database tick, uh, it's really the trifecta. This is the holy trinity of databases. Uh, you heard it here first from me, somebody who's really into databases. Uh, you have querying, ingestion, uh, and management. So you know you need to get your data in somehow. You need to query it and you need to manage it. And in any talk that's worth its salt, like the previous talk, you heard each of those systems being mentioned as something that people were interested in. So I'm going to cover these uh, in three sections. First, querying. Uh, so uh, querying in Druid, when the project first launched, looked like this. This is, this is the native query. This is a native top-end query. Uh, you write it. It's a JSON object. You send it via HTTP. Uh, there's nothing magical. If you can use curl, uh, you can write this query. Uh, if, you know, from any uh, programming language, you can issue uh, HTTP calls. You can run this. It will return a JSON array back. And uh, it's pretty simple in conceptually to use, but the, the query itself is very complex to write. Like, it's very not obvious what this query does, and it can be very intimidating. In fact, this query is kind of like machine code, uh, because it directly tells Druid what to use, it tells it exactly which query engine to use and uh, which data source to scan and even how to limit the segments by interval. Uh, so the first thing we did when we started thinking about making Druid easier to use and more user friendly is we actually used Apache CalSite to make a SQL layer around it. 
And this was a this is a huge usability increase, uh, no doubt. I mean, there's certain um, companies that I'm sure wouldn't have even given Druid a second look if it didn't have uh, SQL. And SQL is legitimately very useful for when you're just like trying to prototype something. Uh, and for a while, we launched SQL, uh, Druid SQL quite a while back ago. It was always in the experimental phase as we were ironing out the issues, for example, like the filter expansion. And then in 015, we finally declared it production ready. Uh, because we just have enough people actually using it in production, uh, playing with it, and we, we had, you know, bugs, we run out all the things, and we fixed everything, and uh, this is good to go. It also uh, kind of slowly over time increased in its capability, uh, and now we've kind of presenting it as something that can be used as the, the first order language. Uh, and querying is also, you know, when you have a query, you might want to actually run it. So you could post the query through curl or what have you, but you can also go into the console and use the, the nice query view that's now given to you to, to submit this query. And the nice thing about the query, the view in the console, it's really there to make it easy to learn how to query Druid, how to do it effectively, and uh, debug something if you're having an issue. This isn't meant to be your query UI, this is just the console that comes with Druid, but it is completely integrated with the Druid SQL uh, language. It actually compiles the docs into itself, so it can do uh, uh, autocomplete. So if you're just thinking, oh, what does that function do? You just start typing it, and the documentation will appear right there and then. Um, we also added the ability to quickly do an explain query and actually for a given query see the underlying, uh, the underlying JSON query that you want to execute. So if you're thinking, hmm, this uh, SQL query, is it still doing that weird thing where it expands filters to a really crazy, in a really crazy way? You can verify that it does not do that anymore. That was fixed. But also, this is very useful because it's very interesting to understand how uh, SQL plans its queries, and it can be very educational. So teach yourself, teach yourself Druid native queries without ever looking at the documentation by just mashing the explain key. And for some reason, this slide doesn't load. So. Uh, Okay, and, and lastly, we added a functionality to this query view where you can actually modify the, the SQL queries directly from the UI by interacting with it. And this is very cool. It's actually too cool to describe it in a screenshot, so I'll do a demo later on. Uh, all right, avoiding that uh, slides bug now. Management. So uh, how do you manage data in Druid? Well, uh, first of all, when you're thinking of management and you're thinking of Druid, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to deploy the services all across your machines. Uh, and uh, at first, you know, when Druid first shipped, these are the services that kind of came with it. Uh, you had six things, you had to deploy it, it was a little messy, it was like, okay, what kind of hardware do I need for which service? Uh, we greatly simplified this by actually grouping these into just three logical things that you need to deploy. And uh, this is apparent in the deployment scripts that you'll see in a second. So you just have uh, your uh, data servers that actually are the workhorses. They are like actually serving the data and ingesting it and making segments and serving them. Uh, you have your query servers that are doing the scatter gather of taking a query, converting it into things that the data nodes can process and then reassembling and giving you the results. Uh, and lastly, you have the coordination and, uh, and the, the, the master server that just uh, oversees that everything is management right there. Um, and this is exemplified when I say, well, what does it mean? What do, you, what do you mean you drew boxes around it? Well, when you download Druid and you uh, ls the bin directory, you'll see that it, you have a bunch of uh, very convenient scripts that are just there to start the server of your choice, like the uh, you know the data server or the master server or the query server, and that will start all the processes and configure everything just as you want. So it's just one single command that you run instead of having to figure out how to start that. 
It makes deployment a lot easier, and I think it makes the quick start a lot nicer. And in particular, uh, we created a nice little config for if you're just running on a single server, uh, then you have these nice configs that you can run depending on your server size. And there's even one that's a micro quick start if you're running on your laptop or on a very, very, very low power computer, just maybe kicking the tires around. Uh, this is going to be a really nice config that's very optimized for that, uh, that's going to start everything for you in the right way and let you play with it. Um, and when you start it, this is what it looks like. It just uh, internally, I mean, this is just a, a Python script. You can see what it does. It's going to just start the right services, and it's going to make sure that each one is logging to a good file. Uh, it's going to do all of the headache key stuff you, you would naturally need to do for you. So running through Druid Quick Start is now one single command. Um, then there's management in terms of like figuring out what's going on in my, uh, in my cluster right now. And any Druid uh, old timer, and by old timer I mean anybody who's used Druid less than half, uh, more than half a year ago, uh, would probably see or recognize these things. By a show of hands, who recognizes these screenshots at the top? Cool. I, I'm sorry for your pain. Um, so these are the, the old consoles in Druid. They were written by backend engineers, and uh, as a bona fide front-end engineer, I can tell you that back-end engineers cannot write front-end code. Uh, you know, back-end engineers, they make jokes about JavaScript, but I want to see them write JavaScript. Um, so, uh, uh, the other thing that you had is these miscellaneous APIs that, because these consoles, they didn't really go uh, all the way to uh, serving everything you needed, you also had to kind of know these APIs. So legitimately, if you were starting to look at Druid, uh, maybe let's say a year ago, you would need to look at this thing, you need to look at this thing, you need to look at uh, uh, the APIs, and you'd also need to have the wisdom to know the difference. Uh, but now, it's much simpler. It's just one single console that does everything for you. Uh, everything is divided into tabs, and it's very consistent. Another nice, uh, nice thing is that the whole thing is powered by system tables that are themselves running on top of Druid SQL. So uh, like any SQL database, Druid is now uh, able to give you metadata about itself in SQL. So uh, if you want to understand, okay, what segments do I have in my cluster? What tasks am I running? All of these things, you can actually, for any view in this console, you can click on this button right here, and you're taken to the actual SQL query that this thing generates. Which means if you're thinking, oh, like, I see this view, but I want to be like, I want to maybe add another column to it, or I want to like understand how, uh, like, I could maybe have a monitoring service that like triggers if this value is above that amount. Very simple. Click one button, you get the SQL query for it, mess about with it in the built-in query view, and you have yourself, um, you just saved yourself like all the work. You don't have to open the documentation at all. So that was management. Uh, and uh, management is very important to, to get it right, and I'll, I'll showcase that all in the demo in a second. But I want to talk about ingestion, because I think ingestion was always uh, kind of the, the the, the thorniest thing to get right in Druid. And it's also the thing that, you know, if you don't get your data ingested into a database, you really can't play around and validate for yourself that it's really, really fast. I mean, if you have your data in a, in, in a database, uh, you might be like, oh, I have to write a JSON query to query it, like it's weird. But then you run that one first query, and it's magical by how fast it is, and you're hooked. Uh, it's only, it only takes one shot, and then, then you're hooked. Uh, but uh, if you don't get your data ingested in the first place, then how will you ever know how good it is? Uh, well, uh, ingestion was always a, uh, a bit of a pain. Uh, because uh, you have to write these, uh, the theme of Druid is JSON. You have to write these big JSON blobs that describe uh, where your data is, how you want to ingest it, what kind of things you want to use, uh, like methods, uh, what kind of schema you will build, and all of that. Um, and you spend a while writing this, you kind of write this big JSON, you probably use the documentation a lot and you maybe have two ta you know, a tab and then a text editor, you switch between them and you write, 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 write. 
and then you submit it and you cross your fingers and you get an error and you go look at the logs and you're like, oh my god. Uh, and that was the typical way of ingesting data into Druid. Uh, does that sound familiar? Mm -hmm. It is, because you've already done that when you file your taxes, if you were to do that directly using the 1040 form. Uh, and that's why people don't file their taxes like this. Um, so uh, we, we put our heads together, and uh, you know, this was earlier this year, we were thinking about how to solve this problem. It was in April, um, we were thinking about taxes, hence uh, the data loader that is a uh, almost direct ripoff as far as uh, a conceptual ripoff of a completely different product can be of TurboTax. Uh, just like TurboTax, uh, it takes you through ingesting your data one step at a time. The end result is that you still build that ingestion spec just like in TurboTax, at the end of the day you just fill in the 1044 and at the end of the day you just fill in the form and you e-file it, same exact thing Step by step, you add uh, the columns and the rows and whatever, and then you get the ingestion spec that's all written for you completely mechanically. You can edit it however you want if you, if you choose to edit it in the raw, but you're probably just going to click submit. And the cool thing is that it actually, at every step of the way, it runs it against Druid at every single click that you make. So if you make a mistake, uh, you will spot it as soon as you make it, not when you later have to submit the spec. Uh, which is just like in TurboTax when it gives you uh, a meter for how much refund you are getting so far. Um, and then you're like, oh my god, well, $1,600,000 of refund, I'm doing great. And then you think, well, maybe I'm not doing that great. Maybe I should have like filed earlier and gotten that refund because I could earn interest on it. Am I actually not good with money? Never mind, let's do some data ingestion into Druid. <laughs> Uh, so this is how it looks. It's a step-by-step -step process, and it's pretty cool. And actually, we recently released Druid 016, uh, where this thing re received a major facelift, and I'll kind of show a timeline of that. Uh, but one of the biggest things that was recently released is the ability to uh, connect to a streaming data source with just a few clicks. Uh, so to something like uh, a Kafka or a Kinesis. And this is, uh, it's hard to kind of show this with pictures. Uh, I'd much rather just give a live demo. Um, so, let's see. All right, so, right here I have a Druid cluster. It's running, it's a real Druid cluster that is for real running. Uh, and it's serving lots of things, and actually, uh, you know, like, uh, those tiers we're talking about, we have them. Uh, the tasks, they're running. Segments? Yep, yeah, it's got segments. Um, but let's add more segments to it. Let's, let's load some data. So, uh, you know, this is, uh, if you want to play around with this, I highly recommend you try. There's even some example data sets for you to try. There's a cool quick start. But I'm going to just select Apache Kafka here and I'm going to connect to a uh, topic. So, all I have to provide is the things that are highlighted in blue. Uh, it, it will guide me through. Uh, each step of the way, and if I'm wondering, ooh, what are bootstrap servers? Well, if I'm wondering that, I probably shouldn't be using a Kafka ingestion. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to bootstrap it with this server right here. And I have a topic called GitHub that's ingesting uh, the publicly available data set of, a, uh, of GitHub, which is a very prominent social network for sharing code. Um, so this is GitHub, and I'm going to preview this data set, and it's actually going to go out, sample a few raw data events from this topic, and show them to me. And I can, th this is there just to be like, yeah, um, everything so far is good, we've identified the topic correctly, and to me, visually, it looks like JSON. Um, so I'm going to actually click parse data. And uh, this, will, this will pick up the fact that it's JSON and it will actually parse it. Uh, it will select the parser for me. And as I'm going along through this, I'm actually under the hood editing the spec through, through these steps one at a time. Uh, and it's showing me so far what is Druid thinking that this data is. So, so far we know Kafka, we know GitHub, we know the bootstrap servers. I connected to the right server, that's great, that does look like GitHub data. 
and uh, this is how it will parse into columns. That looks legit, and I can see what the underlying row was. Okay, that's good. Uh, next, very importantly, Druid shards everything by time. So it's very important to get the parsing of whatever column you have as time correctly. And this step is dedicated to that. It really gives it the importance that you, that you that it needs that you might miss if you just went through the documentation. And here I see uh, that it's parsed time for me correctly. You can really play around and see how you can parse really anything as time. It's really fun. Uh, I'm not going to do it for this demo, but uh, please download it and play with it yourself. Um, little known fact, uh, Druid can actually do uh, transformations and filtering as part of the ETL, just like uh, these are very simple transformations on a row-by-row -row basis, but they can be very useful. Uh, it's a little known fact because maybe by the time you actually finished writing that JSON spec, you're already too tired to read any more documentation. Uh, but it isn't little if you have it just nicely exposed to you. So I could click on something and I could maybe have uh, you know an H plus one uh, here and I could add uh, this transformation. And it will actually go to Druid and it will show me what it would, thinks it will do. And this is very useful because now I know that I guess Druid will interpret nulls as zero and actually uh, that, that, that now I know how Druid will interpret that addition. It's actually going out to Druid to do that and, and that's very useful. Uh, and similarly, I could just drop it right here. And again, it will do, do a preview for me. So I could also filter my data out as I ingest it. This is something that Druid could always do. Uh, but it's very helpful to have a step for it. And then I reach the very important uh, schema step where I can actually understand uh, what the schema of Druid will be. This, is, this step is exactly showing me what will be in my data source. And one of the most powerful features of Druid is this ability to do roll-up. This ability to take a bunch of columns uh, that are uh, you know, maybe you drop some data that you don't need, maybe you, you put it instead of, maybe I don't care specifically about the user, uh, I only care about uh, the repo. And it actually gives me almost a preview here of what my roll-up will be. In fact, I'm seeing that like uh, this event will be rolled up. Um, I can play around with my query granularity here. Uh, I can drop uh, a column and see that my roll-up will uh, likely rise. Um, if I keep dropping stuff, I guess, I don't know. Drop this one as well. Oh my God! Look at how much rollup I'm getting. Uh, rollup is something I'm not going to cover here, but it's very helpful to have a preview of it. But I'm going to turn it off. Uh, I'm going to turn off rollup completely and just have this data ingested as just flat, like one row in, from the data equals one row in the the data set for simplicity. Uh, lastly, I'm going to do all the partitioning, tuning, and pub and publishing configurations that I need. So I'm going to say I'm going to have uh, our long segments, um, I'm going to use the, um, uh, the earliest offset here. Uh, so I'm going to take the data from the very start of my topic. And I'm, going to, I'm not going to tweak any of the other things as part of this demo, because this is a very simple demo. But uh, you know, if I wanted to understand what does task count mean, what does completion timeout, all of the documentation is actually being compiled into the console right here and available through these info boxes. So it's very helpful if you're trying to understand what it is without having to cross link between documentation, just have it right there uh, in line for you in the UI. And then uh, let's give this name. Uh, I just, I'll, I'll do GitHub pin. Uh, and then I'm gonna say uh, next. This is the final step where it's like, all right, we've generated this spec as part of this, uh, this process. And I'm going to just submit it. And as soon as I submit it, uh, it will go into the, to the right view, to the supervisor's view. There I see that it's pending. Um, I could uh, look at its details when they become available. Uh, I can actually see the history of the supervisor right here. So I don't have much history on this one. Uh, and it's going to pen for just a few seconds, and then it's going to actually start ingesting the data. And this whole process was something that used to take 
uh, hours enjoyed. And hours not of uh, meaningful work that makes you feel like you grew as a human being. Uh, it's hours of cursing and saying bad things at the computer. Um, and then feeling bad about yourself. I mean, like, if you can say these kind of things, what does that make you? Are you a monster? Uh, well, uh, this GitHub pin is now running. Uh, the supervisor is running. Let's see if I, uh, uh, I have any tasks for it. So let's uh, refresh this here. And oh, oh, cool! I have a task. It's running. I have a running task. Uh, it's ingesting data right now. Uh, I can look at its logs, and it will actually tail the logs for me here. Um, stuff is happening. Discovering partitions. Fascinating. Um, and then I can look at my data sources. And. Uh, somewhere in here, oh, there it is, already 78 segments. Wow, Drew is really chugging along while I talk. Uh, and lastly, I can very easily go from here. Uh, so, so far, just recall, this is all shipping with Druid. I haven't ever left any kind of system. I haven't done anything outside of just what comes with the project. I can go here. I can have a nice select star on my, on my uh, GitHub pin, run that. Uh, get some data back, so I'm already I already indexed and fully uh, I can start iterating on this. Um, and um, you know what's cool is that we went from a, a a world where you had to write these JSON blobs and you really had to know what you're doing, to a world where you write SQL, which is much easier because you probably already know SQL if you're messing about with data, uh, and it's definitely much more familiar. And if you don't know SQL, it feels like it's like your fault, not Druid's fault. <laughs> Uh, but what if you don't know SQL, but you still want to feel really cool? Uh, well, the cool thing is that, uh, just as a, as, a, as a nice aside, there's actually a, a, a thing built into here that will generate the SQL queries for you to show you what kind of queries work best in Druid. And in fact, you can actually click on, for example, count, and you can reorder this column. It will actually rewrite the query for you. Uh, so, for example, I can go on age, aggregate, and I can sum by age, and I'll add an aggregate, it will rewrite the query for me. I'll go to repo, and I'll group by <coughs> repo to add another group by column. And now it's going to chug, 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 and it's going to get it. And I'm going to order it by language, and it's going to do it. And this is all happening in real time. Uh, it's executing these queries. You can download your data from here, and it's a very nice place to experiment. Whatever query you wrote down, you can uh, click here, and you can say, "Okay, uh, you know, explain this query for me," and you understand what Druid is doing under the hood. Now, because uh, top end, you know, only supports one column, and I added two group by things. Now, I'm using uh, two, two grouping columns. Now, I'm using a group by query. This is very helpful to know, and very helpful if you're running a query to understand why it's running not as fast um, as you might expect it to be, or maybe even why it's running faster than you think it should run. Uh, and lastly, I can click here and actually copy the query ID to take it to my other tools and, and go with that from there. So uh, that is a nice uh, kind of demo. Uh, I highly advise uh, you to play with this yourself. Uh, one of my favorite features here actually is uh, the fact that you can load data from your clipboard. Yeah. Uh, so somebody just sends you like, hey, I have some data that looks like this uh, in Slack. Just like, here's like three rows. Paste it in here. Load it. Easy. Um, and uh, so. What's the kind of the timeline for this? So just looking at the, the past, uh, Druid has really advanced in the past. You know, Druid releases are quarterly. So this is really looking at the last, uh, other than you know, Druid SQL introduced sometime in the past, but uh, not actually uh, like introduced as an experimental feature. Uh, since then, we, you know, the past four releases, we just did Druid 016, uh, I think a week ago or two weeks ago. Uh, and uh, this is the FOMO slide. This is the slide if you are uh, using Druid uh, and you're using an older version, man, you really should update. And if you are not using Druid, now is a great time to jump in and then give it a kick around. So as you can see, uh, in the world before Druid 014, there was no new console. 
Um, and it's only in Druid all 13 that you could actually query all of the system tables via SQL, so you can like forget about all the APIs and, uh, well, if you're in the world before all 13, you have to remember the APIs. Uh, in L15, we made SQL no longer experimental. Uh, we uh, added the point and click data loader for batch data that I didn't show, but that you see in the quick start. Uh, we added the query auto completion. And then in O16 that came out just now, uh, we completely revamped the docs to make them a lot more friendlier. I really appreciate you com complimenting the docs, but I think they're even, even better now. Uh, we added the streaming data loader, which is what I just uh, demoed. There's a cool tool now where you can re-ingest uh, data from Druid into Druid. Specifically, it's uh, this thing. So you can re-index data in Druid. It's like a, a create table from select. Uh, and it, again, it guides you through a point and click way and you can show you how you could dump some columns and maybe get better optimization as a result or maybe you want to filter out some data for privacy reasons. Um, and then we also added the interactive core review. And most importantly, clipboard-based ingestion. You know? <laughs> like, people debate about whether you should be doing batch or streaming Kafka. Or like, just slack your data to me. Just slack it to me. If it doesn't fit in Slack, I don't, I don't really care for it. Um, so the future of this uh, is really cool. Uh, one of the things that uh, I should mention here, uh, but it, I don't because I really just focused on usability, but uh, one of the things we added was uh, continuously improving the performance and quality of the native batch ingestion. Uh, and our goal there is that uh, in well, what we added so far was the ability to parallelize it, so it's not just one thread and one middle manager. Uh, now, uh, in fact, there is a little. Uh, if I just pick some example data, and I'm just going to skip this. Uh, there's a cool little toggle for do I want parallel or not parallel. Actually, some UI will be different because not they don't support the same options, but this will guide you through it. Um, so uh, one of the things we were trying to do is we were trying to make it so that when you spin up Druid, you don't have to use Hadoop. You don't have to use Spark uh, or anything. Druid is the data system that will ingest all of your uh, data, and will be it batch or streaming. The streaming thing is really nailed down already, but with batch, uh, you know, uh, we're going to make it... Uh, we're going to give it the ability to, uh, we, there's certain simplifications we need to make for parallel loading. We're going to give it the ability to read uh, uh, binary files like uh, Parquet and Orc and load data directly from HDFS. Um, and then when that all comes together, uh, we hope to have a goodbye party for Hadoop. Uh, and also, one really cool feature that's going to make its way into this console is actually an automatic uh, doctor that will scan your Druid cluster using our uh, guaranteed open source know-how and um, will tell you all sorts of cool ways you can improve your performance by uh, just uh, applying certain heuristics that uh, uh, we can do programmatically. And uh, so, so this is all product improvements. This is everything I've been talking about is stuff that's going, is committed, uh, is, you know, pull requests. But you know what else? Uh, we have a really cool community. So uh, if you have, uh, if you're interested in Druid, or if you just like uh, screenshots of the console and memes, uh, join our Slack channel uh, where there's always really cool, vibrant activity. Uh, you know, people talking on it right now. Oh my God, so many messages. It's, it, you, might, you might want to mute it. It's so verbose. Uh, and uh, I wish Slack had better support for threading. Uh, so uh, also uh, join the, like our, our mailing list that's all threaded uh, if you prefer to communicate over email. And uh, also join us on GitHub, that social network I was ingesting data from. And if you like it, uh, star us. Uh, if you have any kind of issues, open issues, and hopefully contribute your code back to, to the community. Uh, so thank you so much. This is how we've been making Druid easier to use. Questions?
Hey, yeah. this is Slack channel. The Slack channel is, uh, it's actually the Apache Slack channel, the ASF channel. Uh, so if you uh, go to Druid community uh, and in here you have a cool, in, you have to use the invite, you have to be cool enough to participate. Uh. So the invite is here, you join the ASF channel, it's for all the ASF projects. And uh, don't post in the welcome room, be like, hey, how make Druid quick? Uh, <laughs> come into hashtag Druid, and uh, and uh, yeah, the, that's that's where the magic happens. Uh, there's always tons of discussions, and I pretty much just hang out on the Slack channel because I love it. Um, and yeah, you can you know I don't know if how you how much you guys know about Slack. It's like the best, uh, and you uh, I, I secretly w w wish uh, Slack. I don't know. I love it. Uh, if, you have, if you use Slack at work, just add the Slack workspace. It's so easy, and then just come in for the when you're, whenever you're feeling down, come in for the cool Druid memes. Um, cool. Best question. Thank you for that. All right. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned the Druid Docker as a future thing. Um, are you gonna add any of like? Uh, yeah, that's something that we're we're looking into. Druid produces a lot of metrics. They're best stored in Druid itself. Uh, the Druid Doctor is a different kind of idea from that. It's really uh, utilizing the system tables to uh, just there's a uh, it's a very simple idea that it's like there's literally like a set of SQL queries that uh, if you run them. Uh, they would probably tell you if there's anything wrong with your cluster. It's like segments that meet a certain quality, tasks that meet a certain quality, and stuff like that. And uh, I was looking at that list that I have in front of me, and I was like, this should be a blog post. And I was like, no, this should be a doctor. So that, that's what it's going to be. Uh, probably with a blog post as well. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Um, cool. Well, yeah, everybody tried out uh, Druid 016, just came out, best time to give it a whirl. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Pinterest, for, uh, for being part of the community. Fun for staying for this last talk of the evening. I'll keep it short, it'll be 10 15 minutes. Um, I just wanted to talk about the Druid roadmap, a couple of things coming over the next uh, the next few months or so. First off, who am I? I'm, uh, I'm Gian Merlino. I'm a, like I mentioned earlier, committer and PMC mover on Apache Druid. I'm also a co founder at Imply, a company built around Druid, and we are hiring. So if you're interested, come talk to me afterwards. We're doing a lot of cool Druid stuff, uh, like the stuff that you'll see on the next few slides. Um, so, uh, I'm going to talk about three interesting features, or three interesting real projects, really. Each, each one is a few features coming up over the next few releases. So, the first one is a, a project we call Super Batch. Um, so, one thing that Badim mentioned in his talk is that uh, we are looking to get away from our dependency on Hadoop as the main scalable way of doing ingestion in Druid. Um, it's also something that, that Philip mentioned in his talk, that um, they looked into native ingestion and Hadoop ingestion and found that um, native ingestion was kind of bottlenecked and Hadoop ingestion was kind of a pain in the butt, and then felt, um, you know, felt the uh, desire to move towards, uh, let's say we can do something like Hadoop ingestion but with Spark, which okay, it's cool, but what we really want to do is we really want to make native ingestion good. Um, we don't really want to make it great again, it was never great, but we're going to make it great for the first time. Um, so the goal of, of the goal of this super batch project is to provide a MapReduce style native indexing system inside your built into your um, removing Hadoop as dependency by really uh, kind of almost having a mini Hadoop inside your you might you might think about it. So um, the idea is you have shuffle and partitioning uh, built inside Druid. It's a two-phase shuffle system with map and reduce, um, similar to the map reducer of Hadoop. We are introducing this in a few different phases. 
Um, so uh, we're introducing this in, in phase one was in 0.13 of Druid, which was, like Vadim mentioned, we do releases every quarter. We're on 16 now. That means that must have been about three quarters ago, sometime last year. Um, and uh, that introduced parallel indexing. So that was the first big improvement in Native Batch. When Native Batch was first introduced, we sort of had Hadoop, which um, was very scalable, but built on this Hadoop platform, which was kind of a bummer. Um, parallel indexing meant that native indexing could operate in parallel. But it wasn't able to do shuffling and partitioning. It was sort of what you would call map only in the Hadoop world. So in 016, the much more recent release, that came out about two weeks ago. Um, so very new. Uh, we added shuffling and partitioning for native batch, so you're able to do a partition spec similar to what you could do in Hadoop, um, and have a native batch ingestion also partitioned by some secondary dimension, also shuffle things for optimal rollup, which is really nice. Um, that gets us a lot of the way there. Uh, and to get the rest of the way there, we need to do a few more things. We need to be able to determine partitions automatically. So one thing that's happening in native batch right now is we can do shuffle and partitioning, but you still specify a number of partitions. You say, I'm going to have three partitions or four partitions. With Hadoop-based indexing in Android, you say a target partition size, and that's, that's a little bit nicer of a user experience. So we want to build that into native batch so you can determine partitions automatically. Um, we want to be able to read uh, binary data. So right now with native batch ingestion, you uh, can read, it supports text-based data, but it doesn't support binary data. So it supports TSV, CSV, JSON, doesn't support Avro or Parquet or Orc. So I want to add that, and we want to add the ability to read from HDFS. So right now, um, native batch ingestion supports reading from cloud storage, like S3 and Google storage and all that, doesn't support reading from HDFS. I think it kind of does make sense to do this. We want to remove Hadoop as a dependency in terms of Yarn and MapReduce, um, because, uh, well, we think those things are, at least I think those things are dying. Um, but HDFS is not dying, HDFS is great, it's here to stay. Um, and so we want to be able to still support reading from HDFS without necessarily using Yarn and MapReduce to do so. Um, the idea is that this project is something that's been going on for a few releases. It'll keep going on for the next one or two release cycles. We really want to wrap this up about two cycles from now, so that would put it in sort of spring, early summer next year. Um, Druid SQL is another big project. So this, uh, in the olden days of your, um, who here, show of hands, used Druid before SQL was introduced, before 0.10? I, I, I see you. All right, so two, two hands up, um, and they're, they're both people I used to work with, uh, as opposed to the much larger number of hands up uh, when I asked earlier who's using Druid. So um, yeah, so Druid SQL was introduced about a couple years ago. Uh, it was a really big change in Druid, the ability to correlate with SQL instead of the, that goofy JSON form that the team was showing. Um, and the project goal, it's really a multi-year project for a database as complex as Druid, a multi-year project to uh, become fully featured from both the Druid perspective and the SQL perspective. So that means two things. It means having Druid SQL support all the stuff that native Druid queries support. And it means um, adding more functionality to native Druid queries and the Druid SQL such that it supports all the standard SQL features. So that there's kind of two sides to that coin. Um, where we're at now is uh, SQL's been introduced. Uh, we added system tables in Druid, so that replaces a lot of Druid API functionality. So stuff like what segments are in the cluster, what servers are in the cluster, what tasks are running, or things you can get directly out of Druid SQL now without going through JSON APIs. Um, and it's also uh, starting a couple of releases ago, starting about three or four months ago. It's been on by default and marked as non-experimental, like Bidin mentioned. Um, there's a lot of future work to do, though. This project is nowhere near done. Um, even though it's on by default and non-experimental, future work includes both SQL completeness, so big things there are joins, window functions, etc. Those SQL features we don't currently support. Um, and then on the other side, Druid completeness. So stuff you can do in Druid using the native APIs that you can't do in Druid SQL yet. So stuff like creating a new table, um, altering a table, deleting data from a table, uh, looking at what supervisors are currently running, and, and a lot of other Druid operations that you cannot currently do through the SQL interface. Um, it's a really exciting project, though. Uh, I think that's, that SQL is um, the right interface or something like Druid. The whole NoSQL movement for analytics was a big mistake. Um, and uh, yeah, this is, this is a, it's a really great direction that we're all really excited about. Um, the third, and I think, I think probably the last project I want to talk about is joins. 
Um, so the, the Philip mentioned um, some of the hassles that arise from not having joints in Druid. Um, we actually do support a very limited kind of joint in Druid today. We call them lookups. Um, we don't call them joins because um, you know, it's, it's, it's like, why use that word when you're not really doing that thing? We're doing something that's sort of like joins. It's, it's like a fact to dimension um, join. It's mm, close. So we call them lookups. You use a lookup operator in Jury SQL. You don't use a join operator. Um, and you define what we call lookup table. Uh, the lookup table is a key value table that is actually represented by just a simple hash map in the Java heap. Um, of all the Druid servers. So it's replicated out to all the Java servers, hash map in the Java heap, key value lookup, it's exposed as an operator. Um, it has a bunch of limitations. Because it's a key value store in the Java heap, um, it does not scale to large numbers of keys. Uh, it can't even scale to more keys than you can reasonably fit in a heap. So after a gigabyte or two, it starts to tap out. Um, and uh, it does not scale to multiple columns, so it's a key, single key, single value store. So if you want to have a product ID that goes to things like a department, product name, you know, so on and so forth, subcategory, category, uh, that's going to require multiple tables, uh, one for each column, and that can really waste a lot of space. Um, and the other issue is that by having a custom special lookup operator in Druid, uh, it doesn't use a join operator that people are familiar with in SQL, and so it can cause issues integrating with uh, third-party tools that are used to generating join queries. So we want to address all that somehow, um, and we are thinking about addressing it through this, um, this kind of, of uh, situation, this kind of workflow of ideas. So what we're doing right now, um, and by the way, when I say we, uh, this is Druid is a community-driven project. Um, the Apache Druid has a, has a wide community. There's a lot of people doing stuff that are not at Imply. Um, I am mostly talking about initiatives that Imply is driving, um, and I'm talking about that because uh, there are things that, because Imply is driving, I have a little more control over. Um, but there's a lot of things happening in the Druid world that Imply is not driving, so we'll talk a little bit later in the community section about how to get involved in the Druid world and how to do stuff in Druid and all that. Um, but uh, what we're looking into is, is moving um, lookups off heap. Um, so moving out of the Java heap into an off heap key value store, selecting a key value store that supports multiple values for the same key to sort of solve this multi-column to one key problem. Um, we're do we've been doing a prototype in-house with something called PalDB. It, uh, just like Spark to Adapter, it also hasn't had updates in two or three years. So I don't think we'll go to production with it, but it's useful for prototypes because it's, it's, kind of, it's the kind of thing we want. It's kind of like a, like a read-only rocks DB, um, which, is, which is sort of what you want for this kind of thing. Um, and this, this big lookup prototype uh, sort of solves these storage problems, but still uses the Druid lookup API. So what's next after that um, is being able to expose those operations through the join operator in Druid SQL. So being able to join one big table with any number of smaller tables, like lookup tables or subqueries. Um, and so that's, that's stuff that I think is totally in scope for Druid, um, and stuff that I think that totally makes sense, and, and we are going to be driving towards achieving that. And then on, on top of that, future work could be, I don't know, the sky's the limit. You could imagine Druid supporting every kind of join out there. Um, will it do that? I don't know. You tell me. But uh, definitely this, what I've, what I've sort of described here about um, one big table and a number of small tables is certainly in scope and certainly something we're driving toward in the nearest future. So what does that mean? That means um, join operator and an in select operator. So you know where something is in subquery. So those are two things that would fall under this project. Um, it means uh, joining onto a big lookup table. So this these off heap one key to multi column tables. Um, and it means joining on subqueries. So it means taking two subqueries, joining the results together. So a lot of a lot of really powerful stuff that I think is going to help take Druid to the next level. Um, okay, so those three things. I said I would keep this short because it is getting late. So finally, I am Druid, so can you. Um, a little bit of overlap with Vadim's call to action, but um, I'll take it. Uh, you can get Druid. You can download Druid. It's free. Um, Druid.apache.org is the Apache version. Go to imply.io slash get started for the imply version, which comes with uh, not just the Apache Druid, but also a uh, visual analytics app to make it apply called Pivot and some other cool imply stuff.
Um, Comply offers something called Druid University. So this is online free training for Druid, teaching you about basic Druid concepts, how to organize a cluster, how to do data schemas, how to optimize your queries. Um, if you go through all the videos, I think it's a, maybe a few hours and it's split up into seven or eight videos. Check it out. Um, you can contribute. So like I mentioned, uh, those are three things that Imply is driving. Uh, it's a community-driven project. You can drive your own things. We're on GitHub. Go to GitHub. You can star us on GitHub. Um, you can follow us on GitHub. You can participate in the conversation there. And then finally, stay in touch. We're on Twitter. Uh, we make all major announcements about your related things on Twitter. So you'll hear things like this, meetups like this one, uh, new release announcements, new features coming out. You'll usually hear them there first if you're not following all the gory details on GitHub. Um, you can join the community, like Vadim mentioned, mailing lists, Slack, meetups, uh, go to jurid.apache.org, and all the links are there. Um, and then finally, at uh, Imply, we are hiring to do Druid stuff, all those three projects I talked about earlier, plus more. Um, Imply.io slash careers. And um, thank you. <laughs> Any questions? What's up? Yeah, so the question is, um, forgive me for paraphrasing, uh, resource management with the super batch project, you know, anything that's comparable to Yarn's ability to add and remove resources, scale up, scale down. Um, so in Druid, we have this, this uh, concept of um, uh, historical processes which store data that's already been ingested, and then these, these indexers that, that are ingesting new data into what we call Druid segments. So, so a table split up into a bunch of tiny little segments, each one's a few million rows. And the idea is they can be scaled separately. So the super batch workloads and also real-time ingest workloads from Kafka and whatnot happen on the indexers, and you, you can scale those independently of the servers in Jira that are storing your larger volume of, of older data. Yep. Uh, is vectorization still high on the roadmap, or is that taking a backseat to these other issues? Uh, the question is, is vectorization still high on the roadmap? Uh, yes, I actually had a slide for that that I deleted because I thought four things was too many. Um, but yes, it is still very high. Any other questions? The team? <laughs> is it true that I have a bunch of Druid stickers in my hand? Uh, the question is, is it true that Vadim has a bunch of Druid stickers to give out? <laughs> yes, it is true. <laughs> um, anyone else? All right, cool. Thank you all for coming.